thinking, in other words, does not create egotism, primarily. It has a tendency to create fear. The reason being that the more we think, the bigger the world looks and the smaller we look. The individual who hasn't thought at all has a solution for everything and will never know whether it will work or not because he has no way of applying it and no instrument suitable to experiment with his own ideas. But the moment we study humanity, we suddenly realize that the universal panacea is extremely difficult. The more we know about people, the less certain we are what will help them. Thus we pass intellectually into a kind of uncertainty. An uncertainty which causes the contemplative person to be accused of being non-active. Actually, he may become so, but not necessarily as a result of contemplation. Because contemplation has as its real end the conservation of energy. Its purpose is to recognize that you cannot attack 10,000 problems uh, like Don Quixote de la Mancha, lancing windmills, that you cannot go out on a night errantry of reforms simply attacking this evil and then that evil and finding that for every head of evil you cut off seven more grow as in the Greek myth. The contemplative person is looking to find the root. He realizes that if he can discover the basic common denominator of trouble and can attack that that with one clear decision, one clear discovery, he can uproot 10,000 evils. That behind all of the mistakes we make, there is one basic tendency to make mistakes. That behind all of the wrong thoughts, wrong emotions, and wrong actions that exist in the world, there is a fallacy. And that this one fallacy must be attacked in some way. That the only answer lies not in tearing the leaves off of the tree one by one, for they will grow again next year. If the tree is poisonous or injurious, the only way to get at it is to chop it down at the root. Otherwise, you cannot remove it. You cannot end it. So the contemplative life turns away from a non-valid action that we are all guilty of, this action of trying uh, desperately to fight particulars, and causes us to turn to the contemplation of those great general principles which are responsible for all the particulars we do not like. And as we go further and further into these problems, we realize that error, as we know it, stems from a wrong concept, a wrong premise, a wrong attitude basically toward life. And this wrong attitude, whether we want to admit it or not, is an attitude of aggressiveness based upon ego, by means of which man is attempting to dominate something that he should obey. He is trying to be free from law, when his only hope is to be free under law. He is attempting to impose himself upon the world, refusing to recognize the fact that he's totally incapable of wisely administering this world he is attempting to conquer. He is trying desperately to cause the universe to be under the guidance of his mentation, when up to the present time he has been unable to demonstrate that with his own mind he can govern even himself. So there are basic errors, and most of these basic errors root in aggressive egoism, root in this concept that we are right and that we are born to command when we are probably actually wrong 
and are born to command only our own resources, which to us is not a glamorous perspective. Out of this, then, man has to reintegrate his way of life. What he is doing is destroying him, and he knows it. Therefore, he cannot sustain it, and he cannot defend it. He can only tolerate it. And as it becomes more intolerable, he will have more difficulty tolerating it. What he must have is a way of life rooted in nature's purpose, in the universal dynamic itself, not in his concept of things. But he says, I, I can't do this because I don't know what it is. The reason he doesn't know what it is is because he has done so much agitating of, him, of himself that he has never been receptive to value. Man possesses, of all creatures, the only group of truly reflective powers that we know. Man alone is a contemplative animal. And because he is a contemplative creature, he has a power greater than any other animal that we know. But he doesn't contemplate. And because in the production of his contemplative nature, certain other faculties and certain other propensities were limited, man finds that he is weaker than the animal in many ways, less intuitive than the animal, less able to depend upon integrity of instinct than the animal, and at the same time not using the contemplative faculties by means of which his own peculiar existence can be preserved. To meet this emergency, the individual must reverse certain procedures. One of the things he's got to do, somewhere along the line, is to break down is this aggressive negation with which he occupies himself morning, noon, and night. This endless fault-finding, this endless cycle of trying to impose his own ways upon others, and also this tremendous effort to keep up with the silly momentums of his time. If he doesn't do these things, if he doesn't make these changes, he will simply go into oblivion with the rest of a foolish generation. He will not win, he cannot, because the final criterion is in his own body, in his own emotional construction which is falling to pieces because of abuse. And this abuse will never be acceptable and will never be the basis of help. And as man tries desperately to adjust to one group of errors, he develops another, keeping his entire structure in an endless state of tension. So a constructive or positive attitude in this situation consists in the individual attaining a detachment from negation first, a relaxation away from criticism, away from suspicion and doubt, not the acceptance of things that are wrong, but the recognition that his power to solve what is wrong lies in the active use of his contemplative faculties. Man's solutions to his problems must be on the level of man, not on the level of beasts. War is an effort to solve human problems on the level of beasts, and it cannot succeed. Each human being has within himself a contemplative power where he must solve his problems by arbitration rather than by violence. When he neglects the power to arbitrate, when he neglects the contemplation of solution, he destroys his humanity, destroys the uniqueness by means of which he has a reason and justification for survival. So we say that the person in these problems, in his daily living, must begin to relax away as far as he possibly can from these intensities, recognizing them not as virtues, but as hidden vices. Perhaps we would have a tendency to correct some of these difficulties if we recognize them as faults, but we do not. 
We have grown so accustomed to them, 